And when I look back at my experience through sailing, uh, there was one thing that I felt was incredibly strong. From that first moment that I ever sailed, I knew exactly where I was going. And although as a child I didn't know how I was going to get there, I knew that I was going to do everything that I could to get me closer to that goal. And that goal, of course, was to sail around the world. And I guess when I embarked on this journey of sustainability, trying to learn about it, and yes, it's, there, is, there must be a more exciting word out there, um, I started to learn as much as I could. And I really struggled with it. I struggled with it for a long time because I realized, you know, as, as we all do sitting here, that there's a massive challenge ahead of us in looking for solutions and trying to find a way out of this so that we can be sustainable. But at the same time, I also realized that there were lots of individual challenges in there. I was used to in my life when it came to planning a project and putting something together to say, right, I'm going to be the fastest person around the world. It's a simple goal. It's a clear goal, and it's a very easy goal to understand. And I felt that sustainability was far more complicated than that. So through the years of learning, through the years of talking, through going to um, various meetings, to visiting power stations, all those things that I did over four years, I guess I realized that what was missing was that simple goal. And what was difficult, and that's what this conference is very much about, is looking at this from different perspectives. And I realized, actually, there's such positivity and ingenuity and creativity. It's incredible when you're with someone who's passionate about their subject, who is showing solutions. And that's what the conference is about, is sharing those things. And ultimately, when you look at sustainability, you know, what is our goal? What does our world look like in 50 years? Because it doesn't look like it will now. And as a very well-known education expert, Ken Robinson said, he said, a young person entering education this year won't retire until 2070. How can we prepare young people for their lives when we have no idea what it'll be like in 10 years' time, let alone by 2070? And I think that's one of the passions of the foundation around the subject of sustainability is education, is inspiring the next generation to think about this differently. And when you look at that long-term vision, what does that world look like? Well, I think there's a few people here at this conference, and this is why it's here, who have a pretty clear idea of that, what that looks like. This conference is about pulling that team together to make something happen. And if I go back to the sailing, you know, when you saw that finish and you saw one person sailing over a finish line, sailing a boat, you thought it was just me. You think it's just, wow, that's amazing. She's sailed around the world on her own. She's got no friends, clearly. She's on her own and she's put the project together. But it was far from it. I worked with the most amazing team of people on that project who were away from their families for three months while we built the boat in Australia. And it's a team project. You know, different people were responsible for different parts of that journey. Yes, I had to ultimately sail around the world, but one guy tied a knot that held the mast up. And if he'd have done that wrong, the mast would have come down and I might not even be here today. So you're reliant on people that play lots of parts in the jigsaw. And I think that's what's so fascinating, fascinating about the biggest challenge I've ever come across, this challenge that faces all of us. The challenge for us all to have a, a, a future that actually functions well and that is that lots of people have to play different roles. It's, it's, yes, there is a big vision. Yes, there is something we're all aiming for. And I think we're beginning to know what that looks like, but lots of people have to do different things to make that happen. And I think that's what young people don't know. They know there's a challenge. They know there's this huge push and drive for efficiency, but there's also enormous need for creativity in all sorts of different walks of life, in all sorts of different skills. And I think that's what we're trying to push out with this conference. It's about helping people to think differently and, and obviously get this message out to the next generation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you again to Peter and his team in particular because um, it's always nice to come back to Bradford and see what's sort of happening. And the sustainability initiatives going on here, I think, are exemplary. I thought the ecoversity concept was great, and I've loved the things they're doing and the way they're trying to uh, kind of in incorporate, include so many different departments on campus. I mean, I'm a chemist, as will become fairly obvious very soon, and chemists have got a habit, like most uh, scientists, of staying in their own bunker. Um, even within chemistry, you know, sort of organic chemists don't talk to inorganic chemists and so on. So I've never liked that. I've always liked to sort of uh, sit at the interface between different disciplines. So seeing what they do at Bradford, I think, is a great example of what should be done, needs to be done more and more, especially in the context of this area. 
of sustainability. I don't mind using the sustainability word. I like the word, actually. I will use it again because, in a way, I'll try to explain a bit more later, but it's, more, it's better for me because I've always had problems with words, you know, because um, the green word's a funny one. So um, when we set up the, uh, the centre, the, uh, what's now called the Green Chemistry Centre in 1998, I got funding from the Wolfson Foundation, you know, the people who made their fortune from the pools, from gambling, but whatever, I don't mind. I always say I don't mind where it comes from as long as it helps us go in the right direction, within reason, within reason. And, um, you know, so we couldn't use the green, we were told by the Wolfson Foundation, great, we'll give you the funding, but you cannot use the green word. Green is not allowed, you have to call it clean. So we called ourselves the Clean Technology Centre for quite a few years, and then eventually, about five years ago, people sort of said, okay, maybe green's okay, so we start using the green word. But actually now, in a way, sustainable is a better word because green actually, you can be green and not sustainable. In a lot of what I'll talk about, a lot of what the area I've worked in has been trying to move in a green direction, trying to green the things, make them more environmentally compatible, safer, more benign, less harmful to workers and to the general public. But actually, sustainability is really what it's all about because sustainability is all about trying to bring everything compatible with the environment in a way that maybe chemistry and many of the sciences and technologies have, have lost their way. They haven't been compatible with the environment. So I'm going to, that's really what I'm all about. Thanks also to the foundation. I have to admit, I didn't know an awful lot about the foundation's work, so it's been actually quite interesting for me to read a bit and learn a bit and hear a bit, both last night and today, I hope, with regards to their activities, because um, again, it's interesting to see activities going on from different perspectives and coming in, especially from non-technical backgrounds which, as I say, I think is very, very important. Um, and also, you know, Ellen MacArthur talked last night about sort of revelations in terms of uh, voyages of discovery. Sorry, playing with puns there. But in a way, I was, it got me thinking again, as I woke up quite early this morning, and I was thinking about this. And I said, well, actually, in a way, I mean, I was, in a sense, I was the traditional academic scientist. I, was, um, I went through the uh, university system in the 1970s when it was all free, essentially. And um, I benefited from that, got my PhD, postdoc, and then became an academic. And that's what a lot of people did. And we kind of followed that route and became an academic. And by the 1980s, I was doing research. And most of my research was in an area called fluorine chemistry. Any of you who know any chemistry will probably realize that fluorine is not green. You know, fluorine chemistry is far from it. It really is quite nasty and unpleasant. Um, it's probably sustainable in a renewable resource sense, but not because there's a lot of fluorine around in the environment. But in terms of the way that fluorine chemistry is done, it is not green. And I, I didn't really think about it. And then sort of mid-80s, I met a couple of guys who were... Um, the chemical industry went through one of its phase changes in the mid-80s. And what happened was that a lot of small companies saw the opportunity to make a lot of money quickly. There was a big movement towards what are called speciality chemicals, sort of high-value chemicals, like electronics chemicals that we see today. And companies took advantage of that. And I met these two guys who at the time were only in their mid-30s, and they become millionaires almost overnight by basically seizing an opportunity, setting up a chemical manufacturing facility in Knowsley in Merseyside. And they'd made a lot of money quickly, but they were, they, were, they were PhD chemists. They were keen to do something exciting. And so we got talking. We just got on really, really well. Um, and we decided we wanted to do something different. And so they started telling me about some of the processes they ran on this manufacturing site. And the revelation for me, first of all, was the realization that actually what I taught my students to do in the lab was copied on a large scale. So I'll give you an idea. So the kind of chemistry that was going on there was something, I'll give the chemists in the audience a bit of a fix, you know, so Friedel Crafts chemistry. So if you're a chemist, you'll know what that is. It's a very, it's reckoned to be the most important so-called named reaction in chemistry. It's actually a reaction which goes on in almost every major chemical manufacturing company. And if you do that in the lab, we teach all of our students how to do this. What you do is a classic chemical reaction. It's like cookery. You put a lot of chemicals into a pot. You mix them together with lots of heat. And then you need to sort of get out the bit you want. Now, when you're doing cooking on the whole, you, have, you eat the whole thing, more or less. But chemistry, you don't. In chemistry, you only want a little bit. You want the so-called product out of there. And the challenge you face is that in this pot, you've got, you've got the product, okay? You've got other products that you don't want. You've got some starting material that didn't react. You've got the solvent that we always do our reactions in, you've got various additives, reagents we call them, and catalysts and all sorts of things. And you need to somehow get your product out. And what you teach students in the lab is you throw it all into water. And the idea is that water actually separates the inorganic compounds from the organic compounds and starts the separation process. After that, you probably have to do other things like distillation, you know, like you do to separate alcohol from a fermentation mixture. And this all generates huge amounts of waste. 
what I hadn't occurred to me was that what happens in industry is that on a big scale. They do a Friedel Crafts reaction in a huge pot, like a one ton, 1,000 kilogram scale, or bigger. And at the end of the reaction, they release a little sort of vent at the bottom of the uh, reactor, and they drop it all into a huge vat of water. And then they've got this enormous amount of water waste. And what do you do with it? Well, Friedel Crafts reaction chemistry worked with uh, aluminium. It was all catalyzed by aluminium compounds. And they ended up with a luminous water. And uh, this also got me thinking for the first time about using waste, because actually, depending on the situation with the local water companies, they could sometimes sell this aluminous water waste to the water companies for water treatment. And then, of course, we had that incident, some of you may recall, in Cornwall, where there was an accident and somebody actually put the wrong type of aluminium in the wrong part of the water treatment plant. And we ended up with a very high incidence of Alzheimer's diseases. disease. It was never fully proven that there was a connection, but there was enough evidence to suggest there may well be. And it made people think, A, about aluminium and Alzheimer's, and there was a panic, some of you may recall, about aluminium cookware and all sorts of things. People stopped using, stopped buying aluminium pans and things, which is probably an overreaction, but anyway. And there was also a concern then about exactly how you treat waste and what you do with waste. So using waste is good, but you've got to be careful how you use it and what you waste you use and where you use it. Now, this utilization of waste, which is something that's very much a theme of my research, ties in with the closed-loop concept. It ties in, in many ways, with cradle-to-cradle. -cradle. But it also recognizes the fact that it's not just about using the product at the end of its lifetime. It's how you make it. Because the worry is, I worry, that if you make things that, are, that actually are designed in a way to be perfect for reuse and so on and recycling, you may end up putting a huge amount of energy, resources, and so on into the manufacturing process. You have to look at this from a life cycle perspective. You've got to think about resources. You've got to think about manufacturing. You've got to think about product. And then, sure, you've got to think about what happens to the product at the end of life. And that's the kind of thing that I want to talk about today. So what will I talk about today? I'm going to talk about, first of all, a bit more of what I've just said, the kind of reasons as to why, you know, we, I think green chemistry, I call green chemistry, is so important. Um, and then I'm going to say a little bit in the middle about some of the things that we've done, and there's much more of that in our exhibition, so when you get coffee afterwards or lunchtime and so on, you'll be able to see that uh, Elisa, who's with me, hopefully in the audience somewhere, she actually has set up a very nice exhibition which, uh, which has got various examples of things that we do, educational and, uh, and in terms of actual products. And then at the end, I will talk more about education. And again, Ellen talked about education earlier, and absolutely, you know, I mean, to me, the more I think about this, the more I realize education is absolutely fundamental to all of this. And a lot of it's coming down to we have to train the next generation to be fully aware and natural in the kinds of things that we're doing and talking about here. And, and this, of course, is where it's such a privilege to be an educator because I do get the chance to talk to people. And I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. Um, so let's press on. And this is one of my favorite slides because it kind of shows... It's a bit of a sort of reassurance slide for chemists because it actually shows you that, uh, you know, chemicals are essential everywhere. And there is a remarkable, uh, it's difficult to think of anything really that doesn't, just, doesn't rely on chemicals. And this shows you some examples there and some of them are maybe a bit more surprising than others. So in the bottom right hand corner, we have pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals are still mostly chemical products and the general public certainly doesn't make that connection. Um, uh, if you look in other places, for example, you've got aerospace. Um, chemicals are vital there for holding modern aircraft together, basically. The adhesive technology, as well as the composites that go into lightweight aircraft, is fundamental to energy saving and, of 